So good afternoon, everybody. On behalf of ISME, uh, welcome again to the EMRA workshop. And now it's going to start the first part of our afternoon. So next session uh, is uh, devoted to the EU Marine Robots project. Uh, many of us are involved in this project and uh, we will have uh, many presentations about it. The chairs, which uh, uh, I would like to thank a lot uh, for this session are um, Joe Sosa, uh, who is also the project uh, coordinator. Thank you, Joao. Ian Villacrosa and uh, Fausto Ferreira. So uh, I would like to give you the stage. Thanks a lot. Okay, so thanks very much. Uh, can, uh, can we start? Uh, yes, I think we are in time. Ricardo, if you agree. Yep, we are in time. There are many participants, so uh, please. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay, so let me ju just share my screen. I, I assume you're, you're able to see my screen, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, first of all, thanks very much for this organization. It's great to be back at Amra, uh, in spite of the fact that we are, let's say, quite far away, but it's still a great initiative, so it's great to be back. Uh, just a kind of a side note, I'm, I'm in a strange place. I'm in a storage room because I'm in another conference. And uh, so this may look strange, it's a stor storage room. So don't worry, as far as it's quiet, it's fine. Okay, so let's start. So I'll be talking about you marine robots at EMRA. And uh, this is just a sort of a high level schedule. So we'll have uh, presentations by several partners, um, starting with, uh, with me. And then Antonio Pasquale will talk about the WP6, uh, Ralph Bayer about the WP7, uh, Guillaume will talk about the TNA, and then we'll have uh, lots of presentations about TNA users. Um, these are kind of TNA projects that went quite well. And then towards the end, Fa Faust will conduct the, 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 the last segment about Q&A and discussions uh, and lessons learned. So without further ado, let me start with a brief overview of what we are up to in EU Marine Robots. So we have 15 partners from 10 countries. Uh, the project has been going on for slightly over than three years. Uh, and uh, it will be uh, over uh, contingent on an extension that we ex expect to be granted by the end of November. And uh, what is the project about? Uh, the idea is to open up key national and regional marine robotics research infrastructures to researchers in Europe and worldwide and at the same time contribute to establish a world-class marine robotics research infrastructure network. Three types of activities. Networking activities, as you can guess, this is about meeting people, discussing uh, some important topics. Joint research activities, which are about to, first, to make systems more operable, and second, to transition tools and technologies from the lab to the ocean. And finally, the least but not the last, because we'll have interesting presentations about DNA transnational access, which is about to provide access for free to our research infrastructures. And this is done through uh, open calls. And just to give you a flavor, this is not uh, up to date, but this is just to give you a flavor for DNA in action. So we had three open calls, you know, had applications from academia, research institutes, industry, and government. And what you see here in this map represented in blue are um, locations where 
partners have, let's say, their kind of a headquarters. And in uh, yellow and green, you've seen places uh, from uh, which we got successful applications to use our uh, infrastructures. And this is not uh, final, um, but this gives you a sort of a, an overview of the, the global impact that we have and how we are establish, establishing a sort of a world-class uh, uh, network of research infrastructures. Some achievements. So for TNA transnational access, we have two flavors, access to uh, robots or access to integrated experiments. In terms of GRA, we worked on making systems more operable and on multi-vehicle operations, human-robot interactions, launch and recovery systems, vision, network control, systems integration, very exciting developments. We will hear about those from Antonio Pasquale and then later on from Ralph Pachmeyer. We also have highly specialized training, the Pokan Glider School and the Breaking the Surface event, large-scale experiments, worldwide cooperation, and interaction with other research uh, infrastructures and with other uh, flagship projects. Here uh, we have uh, some of the, the vehicles that were used in this project, as you see, quite diverse, and also some kind of a test beds that were also used in the project, as well as ships. Now some final words about lessons learned in future developments. First of all, trends, and we, keep, we need to keep things in perspective. So the pace of change is accelerating and definitely ocean robotics is key to future ocean observation and sustainable exploitation. Robots extend the footprint of what a ship can do. So the future is pretty much networked. And we've been doing this in the triple helix framework involving academia, industry and government and probably needs, needs to be extended to uh, private foundations and other uh, institutions. Um, one important observation is that no robot is an island. So we need new models of cooperation and networking. So we need to design systems for connectivity in making those more operable. Data management is also an issue as well as standardization in interoperability and standardization on procedures for access and use of research infrastructures and highly specialized training. Uh, and finally, the power of networking. So looking into the future, we should uh, think practical, think big and think sustainable. So we think about addressing all Atlantic challenges in a coordinated multi uh, research infrastructure, multi continent framework. We had some discussions along those lines. We need to, or we think that we should enable new science on a precedented spatial and temporal scales and definitely we think that it's very important to get involved in virtual uh, co-development cycles. And this is pretty much what I had to say about um, uh, the project. And uh, now, uh, according to the schedule, uh, if you agree, uh, uh, I'll ask uh, our good friend Antonio Pascual to talk about WP6. So thanks very much. Can you see my presentation? Can you see it? We, we, we see a white slide. Oh, oh my God. So. Just a second. There's yeah, it was, it was a blank slide, Antonio. Maybe this one. The perfect. I hope so. Okay, so let me start this here. Oh, someone advanced the slides. I guess you need to switch to presentation mode. Yeah, something is happening. I'm sorry about this. No worries. We'll get there. We'll get there. No, no worries. We have some slack. So.
Okay, so the um, project is organizing work packages and one of them is what we call joint research activities. Uh, related sorry, Antonio, to, yeah. sorry, you're still not in presentation mode as far as I, I guess that may be the case with other people. Worst case, you can just present this. Okay, I, I'm going. I'm going to do something more drastic here. Okay, and let me regain control over this. All right. No worries. I don't know why it's giving me that option. I have no idea. Can you see now? Uh, no. We, we see the back side of the presentation. Can you see now anything? We see, but we, I, I think that we see that you're in, uh, press, I think it's presentation mode in which you not only you see the slide, but you also see the other slides, so. I wonder why. Otherwise, I would say. Um, I mean, someone has a presentation there. I don't know who I uploaded it. Let, let me try. Yeah, I don't know why it is doing this. What about now? The same thing? Yeah, it's same thing. Sorry about this. Some basic miles. Okay, so let's try now. Okay, perfect. I hope. That's perfect. Thanks very much. <laughs> yeah, but I need the slides to advance. Oh. oh. This never happened to me. Yeah, we can hear your computer complaining. Let, let me click here. Now it's fine. Okay, sorry. Okay, perfect. So what package six, innovation to advance marine robotics. And that's when we got together to work on algorithms, methods, and develop new tools uh, that will afford you know, scientists and engineers the capability to develop advanced marine robotic systems and truly cutting edge tools for ocean exploration and exploitation. So again, the emphasis is on theory and practice and innovative research and engineering. I really have to glimpse through the slides, so I'm going to give you a snapshot of the different tasks. For example, the University of Girona has focused on advanced vision acoustic and manipulation systems for automated inspection intervention operations, and did an amazing lot, amount of work on this topic, and here you can see some of the results that then came up with. Also, Harriet Watt worked in the same area uh, and focused on an application, besides others, on automated pipeline detection and inspection with minimal human intervention. So involving object recognition for 3D semantic mapping and reconstruction with objects. Still under the same topic, uh, University of Limerick developed an automated docking station system for dynamic work class ROVs. And here you can see on the left integration to standard ROVs and uh, TMS, TMS dynamics, and also uh, a wonderful system for pose estimation using low cost LEDs. Again, these are just very sample samples of the work that was done. Uh, there was also um, a great deal of emphasis on cooperative and navigation and control of networked vehicles for increased autonomy at sea with an impact on a number of applications. So involving all the issues that have to do with cooperative navigation, cooperative motion planning and cooperative uh, motion control and with theoretical and experimental work done by a couple of partners including CMRE, the University of Porto, and, and ourselves. The University of Porto has contributed to this task as well. And it is an example, it's, this is but an example, 
of cooperative front tracking by multiple AUVs Porto in the Douro River. And here you can see the uh, plethora of, of vehicles that are accessible to the University of Porto to execute cooperative actions. Now, CMRE has spearheaded this development of um, hybrid acoustic optical underwater communication systems system. Uh, so there was an integration effort between CMRE and IST, and also Ifremer was included, as well as Maroon, uh, in bringing together the hybrid acoustic and optical. And here is an example of one of the optical modems that was developed at IST, and another one that is under development. And here are some examples of tests that were performed, integration of the CMRE cognitive architecture with the Blu-ray modem. There were some first validation tests at CMRE, and hopefully this year um, we will we'll go in the water with two vehicles and try to communicate between one vehicle and the other one by having running on the vehicles, the uh, architecture of CMRE. Um, in what concerns NOC, they invested on advanced systems for underwater under ice operations, um, integration new algorithms for reactive and liberative avoidance, and integration of new sensors and simulation on board AUVs. Marum did uh, uh, quite some amazing work on the development of enhanced underwater LAR system. Uh, and at the beginning, the focus one was on the development of a latching mechanism to enable an hybrid remotely operated vehicle to connect to a submerged large, um, large system. And here are some shots, quite impressive. The hybrid ROV in the pool, and then the vehicle attached to its launch and recovery system. So finally, uh, there was this task on cooperative human marine robot systems undertaken uh, mostly by the uh, uh, University of Zagreb, the group coordinated by Nikola Miskovic and now Fausto Ferreira as well. Uh, and in line, continuing some of the work that was done in the past on the interaction between human and robots, and the, the, the impact is in fact the potential for a quantum leap in the process of mapping and excavating sites and enhancing biological underwater space. Many people are becoming very, very much interested in this interaction between humans and robots. Uh, so essentially they developed these collaborative motion strategies between a human diver and an AUV through extra receptive recognition and evaluation. And you see here the different phases, the different vehicles. I quite like the intelligent underwater glove uh, and the new vehicle with handheld diver navigation, the reduced weight and size. So what was the outcome of all this? Well, it was a, a, a wonderful learning process. Um, I'm not going to to list all the publications that you did in this area, both in journals, book chapters. Hopefully we'll come up with a book soon. And then the fact that we actually transitioned from the lab to the real world and perform many experiments at sea. So I think overall, this work package was, was very interesting and successful. And as Juan said, uh, it will probably end in November. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Antonio. This was great. A great job <laughs> being able to compress all of these uh, developments into <laughs> kind of uh, five or six minutes. And then again, the same thing now going for uh, then again, still a GRA. So uh, it, uh, we'll ask uh, Ralph Pachmeyer also to talk about the WP7. And I'm pretty sure that it will also be succinct and to the point. So, Ralph, uh, are you there? Yes, I'm there. Yes, so, you are. And, uh, Thanks very much. Do you see the presentation? Yep. Okay. Thank you, Joao. Thank you for inviting us to present here. And thank you, Antonio, for giving me just the, the jump into this one from okay. doing the operations at sea and showing some of the, the great technology that they have shown off. So, I'm Ralph Bachmeyer. I'm with the University of Bremen and Marum. 
Uh, it's a research faculty at the University of Bremen. I'm going to talk to you about the work package seven, uh, joint research activities with multi-platform and persistent operations. As you might imagine, uh, COVID has thrown a wrench in all of our work and, and so in the C trials as well. So you will see it a little bit. So uh, the overall objective for us, we wanted to test the infrastructure um, and the capability enhancements that we had at EUMR and um, show some proof of concept at various levels and also go actually and show some of the fun how the infrastructure works in marine robotics as an example and take them out of WP6, a uh, work package six that Antonio just presented to see and demonstrate the probability and uh, the improvement in the technical technology readiness level uh, that has been achieved throughout the program. So I picked a couple of the uh, pro projects. It's by no means uh, kind of complete, but uh, due to time, so I'll move on. So um, one of the first things we had to do, or one of the things we had to do was definition of demonstration scenarios. We had uh, five scenarios picked, uh, 3D mapping, under ice exploration, deployment of complex systems, multimodal secure communications, and inspections of intervention in waves and currents. And you will see examples to these scenarios uh, following this. So, um, so one of them was related to also to adaptation and interaction of existing vehicle test beds. There were multiple done, and here's an example by the University of Limerick, uh, where they included not only the coder, there was a whole navigation suit included and everything to show some, uh, some mapping capabilities with a relatively small uh, ROV, um, and it was great and successful. Um, from Harriet Watt University, and you saw, saw already from, um, from Antonio, the pipeline tracking, they did some other 3D mapping and smart path planning, um, 3D sparse and dense mapping in water tanks and in the dock, and you see some examples here. Um, from um, the under ice work that the NOC did and does, I think, uh, just recently in May of this year, they had some very successful trials in Loch Ness. Uh, they didn't find the monster, I heard, but uh, they had some good trials there and we're preparing for a mission in January, March next year to the Thwaites Glacier um, with modified uh, auto sub long range vehicles. And uh, I'm, I'm quite anxious to see the results. And uh, so far it looks very promising. Other technology, if I can advance here, for some reason I cannot advance now. <laughs> ah, there we go. There must be some timer running somewhere in the background. Also, you saw some of uh, uh, scenario three things, uh, complex systems, particularly University of Porto, but of course it's not only University of Porto involved in these things, um, deployed aerial, underwater, surface vehicles, manned, unmanned, remotely controlled. And uh, it was uh, quite an experience as far as I was told. And uh, a lot of lessons learned how to operate these things. And also it was part of a bigger uh, Etsy uh, work in the uh, west coast of, of the west coast of the US in San Diego, I think. Uh, if you have questions to it, I think Joao was more than happy to answer any questions to, to the, this work. Um, you saw a little bit of the optical modem. There were some extensive tests, so I'm not going to uh, linger on this. Uh, by CMRE, ISTD, um, testing, you know, how, how does it behave in different conditions, how much data rates, um, and then the, the mixed communication protocol was established. Uh, on our side, we did some tests with commercial um, optical modems using uh, our 2000 meter ROV and a modified, heavily modified blue roof vehicle uh, that was close loop flown by a pilot through the optical links. The tether is there because we didn't trust it. Um, so it has no function besides the mechanical function, no power or communication. And we were able to uh, directly control it via uh, pilot interface from the ship through the ROV, this big ROV and the optical modem to that one to approach remote sites and light them up and image them. Um, scenario five was inspection intervention in waves and currents. Um, University of uh, Girona was involved in that and Ifremir, uh, in particular with the ATRO of Ariane. Um, they did some definition of uh, trial scenarios, um, looked into some manipulator work, and you saw some of the work earlier um, from uh, presented by Antonio also. 
um, by some more work by Ifremer was in the deployment of complex systems and multi-platform operations. They used, uh, in this case, um, the QR code patterns in pool tests for ROV positioning in front of the QR codes, which later will be used for docking um, of the Ariane vehicle, for example, to the dock uh, or other vehicles like ROV elevators or uh, the Marum vehicle for all that matters might be using that kind of system to get docking automated. Um, demonstrations through three trials took actually a large part. Um, this is an example from uh, University of Limerick. Um, and you saw the theoretical slide from Antonio where they did actually the docking and they did some demonstrations, some very impressive demonstration, I might add, in heave motion and how well actually the vehicle, the ROV was getting into the cage in significant sea states and how well that works. And as publication on the bottom you see here uh, was quite impressive there. Um, we had some more uh, current, not voluntarily necessarily, but the North Sea of deployment of a blue roof under tidal currents. Um, that was quite a challenge, um, but we managed with an advanced system using tidal prediction and uh, a little bit more advanced controls on the blue roof. Uh, in this particular case, we collected actually gas samples off the seafloor, uh, methane on natural seeps. There were some other interesting technologies included. And that actually concludes my slides and, and I think Joao already summarized that slice. <laughs> you know, the, the, the world is connected and it's getting more connected and we have all sorts of opportunities to, to make that happen and um, work in the future. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ralph. Uh, uh, yes, but your slides look prettier. So, <laughs> so thanks very much. And uh, now we will switch to Gillan, who will be talking about the TNA, and then we will lead the let's say let's call it the, the session about uh, TNA access in projects. Uh, Gillan is from the University of Girona, and then again another good friend. And actually, this project has been very interesting in that sense because you may found this strange, but we never had an argument. So. <laughs> 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 okay, so thanks very much, Gilan. <laughs> okay, thanks, Joel, for the introduction. As he said, I'm from University of Girona, and I will give you some numbers on the transnational accesses that we had through the project, and then we'll go uh, through all the presentations of the users that are in MRO. Uh, so first, as uh, Joao already showed, we have a lot of uh, infrastructures that we open up to uh, third party users that they could apply with a very simple process uh, and get the project approved. And then they can come to our installations or do it remotely and do the projects that they want with uh, state of the art vehicles and installations. Uh, we had a total of three different calls. Here on the bottom, you can see the more or less the timeline. So it took us half a year to prepare everything to have the first call. In the project, initially, there were only uh, foreseen two calls, but we seen that uh, with the third call, we'll have a lot more users. The third call, it happened just when COVID outbreak started. So we had to extend a lot the deadline to, to get all the people to apply. And as they said, uh, we got a project extension because of the COVID and, and basically the problem of uh, TNA users coming to the installations to the project. So we can finish for now until September and probably until November. So here you see some numbers on the on the three calls. You can see that the success rate when you apply uh, for a project is very high. So most of the projects got approved. This gives us around uh, 70 projects that we are running. Uh, we got applications from all over the world, mainly from Europe, but also from the other continents. But maybe it's better that I show the up-to-date version of the map. So in blue, you will see the, the 15 partners and where are their installations and in the different colors are call one, call two and call three uh, applicants. 
uh, apart from the different places from the world, we also check uh, from where people are playing. So mainly we got uh, requests from academia, but also a lot from industry. And then a few applications from the, the private uh, research and development, the public uh, research and development institutions, but also from different governments. And as I said before, the main problems that we had this is that uh, most of the DNAs were thought to be presential. So people got a grant of 1000 euros to travel to the installations and do their project with the state of the art uh, robots. And the main, main effect of COVID was that uh, we had to delay the submission deadlines for the third call. And we had to delay a lot of DNA projects that were already granted. Some of them were uh, adapted to be done remotely. So some of the partners gave uh, remote access to their installations, even if they don't plan for that initially. And some of them we delayed until uh, this spring, where a lot of uh, uh, in-person projects uh, have been done. You can see some examples uh, on the following presentations. And I think I was uh, really on time. <laughs> so we can move to the first DNA user presentation, which is the from the University of Auckland in New Zealand. And it's going to be Ian, Ian Anderson presenting a diver robot interaction. If you want to share your screen. Can you can you unmute yourself? Yeah. Uh, put a new password. So Zoom's just not letting him share the screen okay. at the moment. But uh, I think we just you'll just have to tick the Zoom box, the, the check box there. Okay. Yep. Good. And thank so, you for being awake at this time. I know there is almost one a.m. So I have, have to. <laughs> what, what's going on now? It's it's wanting you to quit Zoom and reopen it. <laughs> It's wanting me to quit Zoom and reopen it. So we can share the screen, yeah. Apparently you had a permission wrong. Okay, can we, um, can somebody go ahead of us? We'll, we'll come in behind when we've sorted our problems out here. Okay, sure. yeah, no problem. Okay. I'll, I'll, so, I'll leave and come back in. Okay. Okay, no problem. Whenever you're ready, just write to me directly and I will put you as the next one. So then we move on to the next one, which is Instituto Hidrográfico from Portugal that applied to go to Plocan installations. And Luis Salamas is going to present. Uh, okay. Made a characterization using LiDAR data from the Lisboa 2019 mission. Go ahead. Uh, hello, everyone. I guess you're already seeing my screen, right? Okay, let me put this in. Okay, so thank you very much for uh, giving us the opportunity to present our work uh, that we did in this um, in the CNA call. So um, my colleagues from Instituto Hidrographic were the ones that were more involved in the operational part of this uh, TNA. I was more of the end user and the user of the data uh, that this produced. So uh, this uh, Lisboa 2019 mission uh, was um, achieved by the cooperation between our uh, Institute, Hidrográfico and Plocan, and we deployed the glider from Nazareth Canyon and it, uh, uh, um, and it uh, voyaged until Madeira Island. This was also done uh, with cooperation of IFADU project. And uh, the, the objective of the, the state analysis that I, I will present here was to investigate um, the surface signature from altimetry data of a Mediterranean water eddy that was identified in the water column from the glider data. So the region where this uh, glider did the, the, the travel was uh, uh, in the Northeast Atlantic between Portugal and Madeira. And this is a very interesting region uh, in the oceanographic perspective, especially for um, uh, a vehicle, autonomous vehicle that can explore the water column 
which is not very common. Mostly they are superficial uh, um, trackers, but here we can uh, view the inside of the ocean. And this is very interesting region because it's influenced by the Mediterranean water, which comes from the Mediterranean Sea and uh, flows near the Portuguese coast in the slope current. And in this region, there are medis that are often um, detached from this Mediterranean water, which is uh, approximately between 600 to 1000 meters. So it's really in the interior of the water. And so when we were analyzing the, the track of the Medi, which is here in color from the Nazarene Canyon until Madeira, we detected a Medi in the Tagus Abyssal Plain. And this is the, the focus of our analysis here that I will present today. So this Medi is a, a warm and salty a uh, rotating structure that forms from the detachment of the Mediterranean uh, current. And it's, it's located around 600 to 1000 meters. So it's really within the range of the glider, which uh, travels until 1000 meters. And we can see here in the, in the, the figures, this really salty and warm uh, signature of this Medi. And here we can see the, the signature in the TS diagram, which is really prominent. And so this is very interesting in the aspects for the ocean dynamics. And this is what we are exploring further. If we see here in the lines, we can see the, that the signal of the MEDI uh, in the density field can reach the surface. And this is the signal that we are going to look for in a satellite data. So as a first glance, we looked into altimetry data and we did it across the, um, the glider trajectory over the region where we detected the MEDI. And we did find an increase of sea level anomaly of approximately five centimeters, which is consistent with previous works that has, has been working with uh, the surface signature of MEDIs from altimetry data. But now this field that we use for altimetry may not be the most adequate. So in the future works, we will analyze EO data from Sentinel-3 data, which is high resolution, and also uh, looking into sea surface temperature to investigate this uh, MEDI signature surface. But it, it's uh, really prominent that we have uh, this data in the interior of the water column, which is not, um, which is very rare. So here we also have this uh, operational point of view that if you can identify the medis from the satellite data, it can also be useful for glider trajectory optimization. First, we can, uh, if you want, we can avoid <laughs> the glider crossing the medi because it, it, lose, it takes a lot of energy to, to get it in, to, to liberate the glider from the medi if it's um, uh, caught in that rotating structure. But we can also uh, deliberately divert if we want to study the MEDI. So it will be interesting if we can detect from satellite data um, within a few days prior to the glider crossing the, the region, because the MEDI is while well, they are flowing, but sometimes they, they are not very fast. So we can <laughs> take a few days to look at it, to satellite data, to see where the MEDIs are. And then if we want, we can either cross it or divert from it. And we will also look into the Lisboa, Lisboa 2020 mission, which was done the, the year after. And this uh, continuous glider mission uh, will allow us to study the, the consistency of the, of the dynamics. And again, this is a very interesting region. And we have done some uh, first look into these trajectories and we already found two medis. So we believe that these kind of, um, of, kind of missions will allow us to comprehend more about the dynamics of the ocean interior in this region. So thank you very much. If you have any questions, I believe it's at the end of the session. Yeah, thanks a lot for the presentation. And I was going to say that uh, all the questions for the TNA users will be at the end and we also have some discussion with them. And Ayan, are you ready? And with yourself, please. We're ready to go now, I think. So here we okay. go. So share screen. So right? University of Auckland from New Zealand applying to University of Zagreb. Ah, here we go. Here we go. Okay. Can you all Perfect. see that? Yes. Cool. Yeah.
Wonderful. Thank you very much for inviting us to uh, talk to you. I'm here with uh, Chris Walker and Derek Orbao, um, and um, we'll talk about our uh, our collaboration with the uh, University of Zagreb. So um, uh, move on to the next one. OK, so here we have a, um, uh, we, we've on our side of the project, we've developed a, uh, ge a human gesture capturing glove that um, uh, can do basically rest can can recognize gestures uh, can uh, do basically um, uh, then then the gestures are then taken to a command which is then communicated with the um, with the robot um, and uh, so here we have the uh, one of our prototype gloves here so um, now um, the basis of the glove is uh, we have capacitive sensors in it. These are stretchy sensors. It's a bit of like you've got a um, you've got a dielectric, a rubbery dielectric with rubbery electrodes on both sides. Uh, you can basically capacitance is area over thickness. It's also um, uh, charge per volt. So basically, you can put a little signal on here and then measure the capacitance electrically, then turn that into a geometric change, and then relate that. To, to use that for, for hand motion capture. And that's how we're doing it. It's very good. It's uh, very robust and, um, and linear. So um, I have um, with me my um, our PhD student, Derek, who's going to quickly talk about the gesture recognition aspect of this. So go ahead, Derek. Hi, all. Um, so basically, like Ian said, said, the glove has five sensors, one for each finger. And the algorithm works by reading the raw capacitances of the, of the sensors. And this ranges between 300 and 450 picofarads, depending on if the finger is straight or bent or how well the, fit, the glove fits on the, on the user. So to, for the machine learning algorithm to work, we map these values and pre-process the data and scale them into values of between zero and one. Then we give these values to the machine learning classifier, classifier, which is an ensemble in our case, um, which has a support vector machine or network and decision tree. And with this, we have we compute what gesture is being recognized. Uh, our library has 13 different gestures, most of them used in typing communication. Okay, so that's the the way, basically the overview of the glove. I'm now going to hand over to Chris Walker, who's going to uh, now give you a walk you through this presentation of our um, trans-global experiment in yeah. New Zealand to Croatia, a way of overcoming the... Yeah, we need to... Are you kidding? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so this is the TNA trial we actually performed. The challenge was we needed to, uh, because of COVID, we weren't able to be on the, uh, on the Adriatic actually in the water with this robot. So unfortunately, we had to find a way to be in the water in Auckland, uh, send a command to the surface where it was transmitted over a server to Croatia, uh, where it was communicated acoustically into their pool where they had a robot. Um, and because of the time zone differences, this was 6 a.m. in New Zealand in this pool uh, and 8 p.m. or later in Croatia. And so what you're seeing here is I've, I'm diving right now and the gestures have been performed. It's been recognized by the glove in real time and giving haptic feedback back to the diver so that the, the diver knows the gesture was performed. And the goal is to transmit that and just move the robot around, somehow interact with that robot. Um, uh, I think, well, at least me, I'm not seeing the video. Ah. I don't know if it's the case for everybody. That's yeah, I can see it. Uh, it's top on capacity based train sensors, the, the slides. Oh, okay. Ah, I wonder if we can just play the video. Yeah. Can you see the video now? Mm, not no. yet. Try to share the whole screen, not just a window, and then you can. The application. Oh, yeah, I'll just. If not, I can try to share. If it's the video on YouTube, I can share it if you wish. Mm. Yeah, that might be easier. I don't see the screen. 
Yeah, maybe he can show you the video on YouTube. Yeah, it might be easier to share the video on YouTube. I uh, can't see which, how, it's only given me applications in his Zoom. So you need to not click on applications, but the uh, whole screen, something like that. But I can open the, quickly the video. Okay. Uh, I can share the screen if you don't, if you prefer. Yeah, that might be easier. We'll just talk over that. Okay. Can everyone see the screen? Yes. Yes, I can see it. Yeah, excellent. Thank you, Fausto. Well, I guess you're the one sound, so. Yeah, you can turn that down. <laughs> there you go. Same video. Go ahead, Chris. So yeah, here you see our smart glove. So that's going to be worn by a diver in a pool at 6 a.m. in Auckland. And using Derek's gesture recognition algorithm, it's going to recognize the gesture in real time, provide feedback to the diver, uh, and then send that acoustically to the surface where we have this computer set up. Uh, the computer is connected to a server over the cellular network because there was no public Wi-Fi. Uh, and then that transmits it to this pool in Croatia here, where they're staying up late and setting up the AUV for us to interact with. And so here you can see the glove in action. You've actually got Ian here free diving down there to get some of this footage for us. <laughs> and so the, the goal here was simply to interact with the robot. We wanted to see it move. And this is actually in real time. We synced up the videos. So uh, that first one was incredibly fast, um, but we found uh, the average communication time was around four seconds. And that's the delay from recognizing the gesture, the acoustic transmission, the internet connections all the way to Croatia, and then actually getting the robot to move which we were very happy with. Uh, so we look forward in the future to actually being able to interact with this robot uh, in the same pool. <laughs> <laughs> um, but thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, yeah. Sorry okay, for the, thanks, yeah. For, thanks for your presentation. Uh, in this case, we will accept one or two questions, but very fast because obviously they are in another time zone. And... We're five past one in the morning, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so if anybody has any questions for them, now it's the time. If, if anyone wants to email us a question, that'll be very well received. Very happy to uh, answer any questions anyone has. I okay, have a, a then, quick one. I mean, um, I participated in the trials, of course, but I just want to ask if you do it again or if you want to collaborate with us in the future, what would you change in terms of DNA remote access, let's say? If you have any input yeah. for, for that, because we'll discuss this later. So if you have any input. I think, I think future trials to do it remotely properly, we really need the diver to understand what's going on with the robot a bit more. Um, and once we close that loop connection, um, then we can actually do more complicated tasks. Like simply moving the robot is, is great to prove, to demonstrate that this type of communication works, but it would be great to take that to the next level and get the robot doing particular tasks, um, which, which will happen if we can close that loop. I mean, I mean, ultimately, the conversation between the diver and the robot. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Okay, thanks uh, for the presentation again. Thanks for the, for the question. And now we move to the next one, which thanks is from... <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Bye-bye. Uh, the next one, which is from uh, Indra Pasta Institute of Information Technology from Delhi, India, uh, that applied for the installations of University of Porto. And the presentation will be done by Dr. Uh, Sujit in a multi-AUV area, area coverage undercurrents. Yes. <sighs> okay. So can you see the screen? Yeah, that's full screen if you want. Hi, so thank you very much for uh, giving me an opportunity to uh, describe the work that we did with uh, the U Porto team. Uh, which especially with John and his uh, LSTS members over there. Uh, 
So this is on uh, using multi AUVs for area coverage under uh, currents. So basically like the motivation, as you know, that uh, area coverage is almost important in almost every application, but there are certain applications where you may want to use uh, certain type of vehicle, let's say that a vehicle having a specialized sensors uh, to uh, basically like monitor a specific region. So in that case, when you do an area coverage application, uh, mapping algorithm, so considering these specialized or functional constraints that we call as uh, doing the complete mapping algorithm is going to be a bit more challenging because you need to do manually stuff and you don't, and we want to make it more automated. So in that case, what we did was uh, basically like uh, we uh, did and uh, we converted the entire area coverage problem into an uh, vehicle routing problem, wherein you want to take the sites where you want to map. And for certain particular sites, we put an additional constraint saying that this site must be visited by an X vehicle only because it has the kind of sensor that you want to map it. So for this purpose, we, instead of using the typical optimal, we developed an, uh, a modified insertion minimax uh, algorithm, which basically uh, gives you paths for multiple vehicles such that the path length difference between uh, two vehicles or the multiple vehicles is minimized. So you want to have some kind of a load balance the way in which so that uh, you can cover each uh, path with a similar kind of an uh, time framework. And uh, to develop this, the experimental test bed is where the UMR uh, TN really helped us in achieving the goal. So uh, we initially we set up to do it in during the rep experiment that was jointly conducted by Portugal Navy, LSTS lab and the NATO CMRE at uh, in Sisimbra. Uh, but however, due to a lot, I was moving from one university to another university and I could not um, go there uh, physically. So we conducted, tried to conduct it remotely. So initially we started to set up an, uh, a framework so that I can send the paths uh, by being online at uh, Delhi during that time. And then uh, the experiment being done at the Sisimbra. However, the environment was really an, uh, highly unfavorable. So uh, instead of completely doing one single experiment in one shot, we had to do it in multiple shots and the uh, environment was not good. So we had to abandon the experiment over there and then carry out uh, remotely through uh, at the harbor, which is in luxurious harbor at Majunish. So for this purpose, we develop the area and we put a lot of sites within that harbor area. And then we allowed three vehicles uh, to generate the required maps, considering the functional constraints in uh, some of these uh, paths here or here, things like that. So then these are the three different paths that have been generated by the algorithm. And then uh, th here you can see that uh, the, the Euclidean or the straight line paths given by the uh, planner and the actual paths are flown or actual paths that the vehicle took, uh, considering the all considering the you know, the kinematic constraints into effect. So, and uh, in the last picture, you can see that all the paths which have been taken by three different vehicles, uh, which are very close to whatever the Euclidean distance paths uh, really gave. So here, in this case, this was mainly to show that we can uh, do demonstrate in a multi AUV kind of an application. Uh, in the harbor, but we do not take the sensor into account. So then we conducted another experiment with uh, two different vehicles, wherein we want to have the side scan sonar also as part of it, so that that gives an additional uh, functional constraint on which path the vehicle should take. So these are the two different paths for two different vehicles, which is Lau Noctilus 1 and Lau Noctilus 2. Uh, these are the two paths and the corresponding all the sites can sonar imagery associated uh, with this particular path. So uh, in whole, uh, we were able to remotely uh, get the complete uh, information or exp demonstrate experimentally uh, the paths uh, through the algorithm. And then we were able to test that the, the speed of the algorithm in real time close to how much it takes. Uh, yeah, so this was the entire experiment that we did at uh, Porto. And I should really thank uh, John Sosa and the complete LSTS team for their unconditional support in performing this experiment to and back and forth a lot of times. Yeah. Thank you. You are in mode, Gillian. 
yeah, thanks. <laughs> thanks for the presentation. Uh, we'll move to the next one, which is from, I'm sure I won't pronounce it well, I send in Crea West from France uh, that requested access to the CMRE facilities. And this is going to be presented by Beatrice Tomasi. And the title is Channel State Information Acquisition in Bidirectional and Underwater Acoustic Communication Systems. Actually, this is a pre recorded talk. So, Fausto, if you can play the video. Yes, just a second. So, here, actually, I want the whole screen. Uh, this should be okay. Uh, can you see it? Hello, everyone. I'm Beatrice. Can you see? No, we see the the folder. Okay. Uh, just a second. Okay. Now you should be able to see it, right? Yes. Okay. Hello everyone, I'm Beatrice Tomasi and I will present the CSI Aqua project completed through the second transnational open access school of the EU Marine Robots project. This project has been a collaboration among CMRE in Italy, North in Norway, Previ Analytics in Massachusetts, University of Padova in Italy and ESAN in France. CSI Aqua is a project whereby we collected the recordings of channel probing sequences in bidirectional, so having two nodes that need to communicate with each other, bidirectional and water acoustic communication systems. The objectives of this project are to collect an experimental evaluation of the channel state information quality at the transmitter site. This is important to then evaluate adaptive uh, uh, techniques that need this CSI at the transmitter. Then design and implement a CSI acquisition scheme for bidirectional water acoustic communication systems. And finally, create a new data set that can be shared among the participants of the project. The experiments were carried out at the May to t loon infrastructure. Here, there are four nodes M1, M2, M3, and M4 that can be seen here, equipped by a transducer, the transmitter, and a hydrophone, the receiver for our case. The experiments consist in a module lasting one hour and 20 minutes, like in this table. With a time windows of 10 minutes, within which Pseudo noise sequences are transmitted. For example, in the first 10 minutes, M1 broadcasts a one minute long tonal probing sequence, which is then recorded at M2 and at, and at M3. In the next 10 minutes, M1 sends to M2 a three second tonal probing sequence, which records it and replies with another probing sequence in its turn. M3 eavesdrops these messages between M1 and M2. The collected data consists of four phases, a validation data set with one module of one hour and 20 minutes, a phase one in December with three days whereby in each day we transmitted this module of one hour and 20 minutes four times, a phase two in late December and a phase three in early January. The CSI at one node, in this case M1 here, can be modeled as a function of the reciprocal channel state information plus an error, or as a function of a delayed version of this same channel state information plus an error. With this study, we want to characterize the statistics of these two errors and understand in which case it is most beneficial to use one or the other. In this slide, we 
represent the mean square error in decibel of the difference between the energy of the actual CSI and its estimation with the two methods previously described. The MSC is indicated as a function of the channel input response duration. We consider all possible couples of the nodes in the network. And we measure that the MSC is minimal, always in the dashed line. The dashed line corresponds to the estimated channel, in, channel um, state information of the delayed version. Okay. So it's minimal when the CSI obtained through the delayed version is used. This can be explained by the non reciprocity measured across the different links. Like in this case here, we have a channel impulse response, the magnitude square of the channel impulse response measured between M3 and M2, where M3 is the transmitter and M2 is the recorder, over 30 seconds and over 4 milliseconds. Here we have the way around, so between M2 and M3 of the same link, okay, same square magnitude of the channel, and we can see the sum arrivals that we can see here uh, somehow are attenuated in the other way. So to conclude this preliminary study, um, we, we show that using the past and statistics in a stationary bidirectional the water accuracy communication system is not worse than use the reciprocal channel statistics. Finally, we would like to thank all the colleagues that contributed to this project. So in part Enne, Board Ericsson at Norse, James Kreisig at the JP Analytics, Stefano Tomazin at University of Padova, Anthony Potier, Pierre Jean Bouvet at Isan, Roberto Pertini. Roberto Petroccia, Giovanni Zappa, and Alberto Gratti, and Sia Marie, and Joao Souza. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it. Okay. Thanks for the presentation. And I know it's almost break time, but we'll do another one and then we, we take the break. The next one is from Ulster University that applied uh, for the Marine Institute Infrastructure. And this is going to be presented by Chris McGonaghy and Advanced Mapping of Complex Marine Structure. I think this one is also pre-recorded, Fausto. Uh, yes, I'll share it now. So just a second, I could have not stop share the screen. It was easier. <laughs> Yeah, you stopped uh, it. Yeah, but I have it open again, so I don't know why it's not. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Chris McDonald. You can hear, but you cannot see, correct? Yes. Okay, just a sec. I don't see why. No. Um, let me try. This way. Okay, now I, it should work. You can see it, correct? Yes. Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Chris McGonigal. I'm a senior lecturer in science based at Austria University in Northern Ireland. And yeah, I'm just giving a brief overview here of uh, our activities under the transnational access to even robots. Um, our cruise was advanced mapping of complex marine structures that happened uh, between April and May this year. Um, and we're out on the RB Celtic Explorer, they're pictured on the left, uh, with the RB Etchen from the University of Limerick uh, there on the right, and also we managed to leverage access to NERVS, uh, Gavia Class AVB, that's managed by the Scottish Association of Science and Technology funded as a science team. Yeah, probably the easiest way to demonstrate some of this is just by video, actually. Um, so here's a, a video of some of our cruise activities, which were out in the Malenstadt Sea, and we were exploring some World War One shipwrecks in terms of areas of complex topography to try and look at multi-pass lines of acquisition with uh, photogrammetry and underwater laser scan. And this is made possible because of the, the capacity of the vessel. Here, a 65 meter research vessel with dynamic positioning 
and the home market systems uh, and the rest of the underway data. And the RBS and light work class ROV, which is carrying the laser payload and the, the INS and all the other ancillary sensors that were required. Um, and here you can see yeah, the etching being deployed at night. Um, most of our laser scanning work was done at night because of the sensitivity of the system to, to ambient light during the daytime. So we actually had the laser scanner and the photogrammetric methods attached to different ends of the vessel. Um, there you can see the, the RV control room um, where basically Limerick systems called Ocean Rooms, which is like a semi-automated to fully automated method for controlling the ROVs tracks, which lends itself really well to doing overlapping coverage and very tight line spacing here, which were we had somewhere in the order of 200 lines to cover one shipwreck that was about 200 meters in length. And there you can see the laser scan actual acquisition taking place. And um, there, the blue line you can see on the right hand side from the HD video, the machine building camera in the left. And um, this is scanning the one of the main guns from uh, the HMS Audacious, which is a World War One wreck, was uh, sunk up in the launch of sea. Um, and by, by taking these overlapping images with the laser scanner, we're able to build up a composite coverage. Um, which at an unprecedented level of resolution for some of these features. So across the swath of this laser, we have 2048 data points, which results in being able to pick out uh, features, uh, organic and inorganic materials that are very fun scale. So because this is, it has an explicit geometry that we can relate to real world positions, we can then compare it to photogrammetric methods that we also have uh, from the other tools. Uh, the other system that I've described uh, was SAMS, the Scottish Association of Marine Sciences, who are managing the, the our facility there. This is the Gavia Class AUV Freya, which we also on the, the voyage with us. And here you can just get an appreciation of the deployment that was made possible. This was kind of managed in a stage manner by uh, off with the workboat there, the Tom Cream, uh, in water. And, and that was really the limiting factor that constrained our deployments here were the surface conditions suitable for launch and recovery of, uh, with, for the support vessel, as well as trying to manage the AUV uh, alongside a, a research vessel, which was made possible by the fantastic work of the ship's crew uh, and some of the science party. There you can see, uh, get an impression of the kind of conditions that we're in, which looks like a fairly slight sea state um, when you're standing on the on the research vessel as compared to seeing the Tom Green water. Um, yeah, but all this made possible through the transnational access through EDMR. Um, so with, the, with this work, we were able to kind of amass complete coverage of uh, one of the shipwrecks, the SS Justicia, a partial coverage of the uh, HMS Audacious, and then whole lines of multi beam on a range of other sites using a very uh, high precision protocol. So, yeah, that's a very quick whistle stop tour of what we were doing. And uh, thanks to Marine Robots, Marine Institute of Maritime, Percy Limerick, Sam, and any questions or follow up. Uh, please direct it to me in the first instance there at CD Mobile at Foster. Okay. Thanks very much for your help and support. So, uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, you were going to say something? Yeah, I think Chris might be here. He said that he'll try to connect for the questions. Hi, uh, like... yeah, 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 okay. Yeah. I'm Great. here. Uh, absolutely. Thanks very much for sharing. I, I've managed to duck in quickly to. Uh, to try and respond if there are any questions immediately, but uh, I won't be able to join for the session later today. So, well, I think you heard the Chris. So, if anyone has questions, to uh, please uh, uh, tell them now for Chris because you won't be able to join us later. That is okay if not. So for now, no questions. Okay. Well, we have the mail. If anybody has questions later, uh, you can see the mail on the recording. 
And I know I said break after this one, but we got a request from one of the speakers that he cannot be after the break. So uh, we'll move to another one. This one is from Jacobs University that applied for the ISME installations. And it's going to be presented by Francesca Morelli. And it's uh, all about how to do remote DNAs, successful lessons learned and incidents collaboration between Germany and Italy. So Francesco, if you want to start. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Guillaume and uh, all the organizers. So what I will uh, talk today is uh, our TNA with the ISME uh, nodes in uh, Pisa and uh, Florence and uh, has been a great, uh, great collaboration. And in particular, uh, I want to focus a little bit on uh, the remote aspects uh, and uh, uh, discuss a little bit uh, what were the challenges uh, and uh, some of the lessons learned about that. So, but first of all, let's make uh, a step back. So a step back in 2019, where actually there was no need of a remote TNA, we actually did meet in person. And we submitted a proposal which was called DAMOS for detection and mapping of submarine ships. So this picture comes from the island of Vulcano in Sicily, in South Italy. And it's a place where every year we go in Jacobs University together with DLR and various other researchers and groups for an intensive research summer school yeah. with different... Uh, so, sorry, Francesco, I, I cannot see the slides. I don't know if it's uh, oh. my problem or... Guillem, maybe... Yeah, yeah, I, I see black also. <laughs> so, you don't see the slides? No. Oh. Show. Everything is black. Oh, interesting. Okay. I think no one sees it. I was trying to do with double screen, but then uh, I'll, I'll move to a duplicate screen uh, and then that will be probably easier. Is it working now? Yes. Okay. So there was an issue with the double screen. Good. And uh, so from the picture that we can see here is uh, natural uh, uh, submarine ships of the island of Vulcano. And this has, uh, has very interesting aspects, especially for people studying the, 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 the sea and the marine biology and marine geology and uh, all these, uh, these aspects uh, on, uh, on the sea. And they want to have a, a way to try to quantify the, the gas that is actually out. So, now this is this is application so from one side uh, in Vulcano in the island that we are, but also in uh, in different circumstances. So there is uh, also a lot of emphasis on uh, carbon capture and storage, for example, uh, as we have also seen from the talks about EU policies uh, earlier uh, late in the morning, and uh, so detecting uh, uh, potential uh, SIPs is, uh, is is of interest also in uh, in that scenario. So this TNA uh, was devised in, in two parts. So the first part uh, was uh, at, uh, in La Spezia at the Italian Navy base. And uh, we were working uh, with two different vehicles uh, and we were working there because uh, there was the kind of the lab uh, where ISME used to go. They have all the logistic infrastructure uh, and we could actually get these bubbles. Uh, uh, connecting a, a tube uh, with different holes uh, so that we, it was a kind of a controlled, uh, we know where the tube was, so we know how much gas was co coming out uh, and we collected uh, uh, various data. So this is, uh, for example, uh, from a forward looking sonar uh, mounted on the Filippo AUV, but we also used uh, 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 the Marta AUV using a side scan sonar to look at uh, how bubbles would look like from a side scan. And here um, we have uh, an image from a side scan sonar. Our second phase was to go to Vulcano uh, in, uh, in, in Italy, as I mentioned. And we took both uh, sonar and camera pictures uh, with, uh, with both AUVs in various places of the island. Uh, in particular, in one place uh, there, there, was, there was very, uh, active volcanism activities. And uh, 
That was very interesting. Actually, this got on, on the press uh, in Italy, on the national press. So the ISME uh, did, did a, an extremely good job in advertising uh, the projects and uh, the, the interesting aspects of AUV analyzing uh, these uh, this bubble sites. And uh, we got a paper at Oceans uh, in uh, 2021, Global Oceans, um, where there will be some aspects about uh, uh, vision-based bubble detection. And then we come to 2020, 2021, with the new calls of uh, UMR, and we wanted to add uh, localization aspects, uh, because it's not only important to detect the bubbles, but we need to understand where the robot is and also what are the localization uh, challenges uh, in presence of acoustic disturbances. Because in all these periods, in all these sites where there are lots of bubbles, uh, are DBLs uh, working fine or not? Is acoustic communication working or not? So, and all these are used for localizing the robot, either through the reckoning with the DVL or with LBL uh, for, for with, with acoustic. So we wanted to study a little bit about uh, acoustic interference. Uh, and then we had the kind of the, the DAMOS tool. So with the idea to coming back uh, to, to, to Kano and uh, using also the localization system uh, so that we can try to localize uh, the, the bubbles uh, in, uh, uh, in the sites. Uh, unfortunately, uh, something happens as you, you all know. And we couldn't perform uh, these two TNAs uh, as we were planning uh, in uh, a real, uh, uh, in a physical meeting. So we had to move through remote collaboration, uh, which was something very different from what we were expecting. So we use a lot of various different technologies. So in particular, we use Skype and, and then the WhatsApp to, to get to know about, uh, to, to, to have real-time communication and uh, to, to plan uh, all the different aspects uh, of the TNA. And this is a slide that was prepared by ISME about uh, the TNA that was performed uh, uh, in, uh, in La Spezia and already with uh, some convolutional neural network uh, uh, try to analyze uh, the artificially induced bubbles uh, with, with a tube so that uh, we couldn't get to Vulcano due to the current circumstances. And so also our research summer school was canceled this year. And also this year it was canceled again. Uh, and we hope to go next year. So everything has, been, has needed to be done in much more controlled conditions. And uh, a few lessons learned about uh, the collaboration. I would say it's important to have clarity I mean, this is normal also if you meet in person, but if you meet in person, you can also define things uh, more on the fly. Uh, but when there is a remote collaboration, it's actually much more important to define the objectives at the beginning, to define the interfaces, uh, to have a clear understanding about the types of operation, uh, uh, the types of data, what are the sharing mechanism, it's not that you are on site uh, and you just plug an external drive, uh, you get a rose bug uh, and you are done. But uh, it, there, there are some other mechanism that, that needs to be clarified in advance. Uh, one thing that I find quite useful is uh, actually reserve the time, especially for the remote part. Because the remote part usually, I mean, we were in the office, it's our usual uh, working time. But even when uh, there is an access which is in remote, uh, I think that's like in online conferences, uh, I think it's important to try to block the time uh, like if we will be away, so that the calendar is blocked. Uh, if you are in the office, uh, you, you close the door, or even you are not in the office, you are somewhere else, uh, so that you, you, you cannot be found, <laughs> like you would be away for, for a trip. Uh, I think this is quite important uh, to fully dedicate and have the time uh, to the TNA. And also from the office, uh, um, usually people tend to forget uh, what are the field challenges. Um, so sitting in the office uh, is a little bit different than working in the field. Like for example, if we set a time for a meeting, we meet at this time, and then uh, there are something in the field, something happens, so they cannot come at the time that we initially agree. Of course, uh, the people remotely need to understand that the field is different than in the office. So there might be some 
uh, some aspects that require attention. Uh, they might be unexpected events. Uh, they might be challenges um, that uh, usually are not uh, in, in the office. So even uh, when the, the TNA is not in presence, so we, I think that's uh, a very important aspect uh, is to, to keep an eye on, uh, on the state. So to be close to, to the field state where things can change uh, and we need to be a little bit more flexible. And also, I think that uh, it unleashes possibilities of remote control and remote operations. Um, so depending on the TNA, sometimes the remote collaboration was more or less uh, operational in terms of uh, controlling the robot, uh, launching software and so on. Uh, from one side, uh, it was normal because it was a little bit of a reaction to a, to a, a situation where we couldn't be there physically. But moving from reaction uh, to deliberative uh, and uh, moving towards uh, try to find out uh, what we can get out of the pandemic uh, in a positive way, think about uh, all the doors opened in, uh, in possible remote collaborations. Um, I think this is something that, uh, that is important and can be discussed uh, in, uh, in the discussion session uh, later on. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, that was the, my short presentation. Uh, of the TNA, thanks to Isme uh, and their great support. Okay, thanks Francesco for the presentation. And we have a bit of delay, so we should be finishing the break now. We'll take a 10 minute break. So see, see you at, uh, at 3.50 and we'll continue with the TNA presentations and the discussion. Take your time for a coffee or something. <laughs> see you in a moment.